The Legina brothers have taken their love of treasure hunting beyond the confines of the cursed Oak Island and have collaborated with treasure hunters across the world to tell their story and add their own wisdom and insight into their hunts. The theme of the episode is sunken ships. The idea of sunken ships has captivated the minds of treasure hunters for centuries, and the Lagina brothers are no different, especially since, according to Marty, more Spanish ships sunk than got to Spain. Matty claims that as many as three million wrecks have happened throughout history, and less than 1% of them have ever been located. Finding even a single galleon could be worth easily a billion dollars. Matty and the Legina brothers are sitting in the Oak Island War Room, and they're discussing how this season has been the most productive for the team than ever before. Marty agrees and says they are making a lot of progress. Rick has to agree, but attributes their success to the intentionality of their actions since they had been looking for specific things in the swamp and money pit. The topic of sending divers into an area in Oak Island comes up, and Marty says that there may be a recovery dive coming up, and in that case, he would want John Chatterton on the trip. John Chatterton is considered unparalleled among the divers of the world. He is one of the most accomplished deep-sea divers in the world. Over his career, he has explored legendary wrecks like the Lusitania, the Andrea Dorea, and even the Titanic. He is also a treasure hunter, and his interest began when he was just a boy. According to John Chatterton, he grew up on the beach and had his first scuba dive at just 10 years old. When the guys called John Chatterton, they let him know they want to invite him on a future recovery mission, and he lets them know he will make time for it. Marty thanks him for his work on the 10X dive that took place in Season 3 of Curse of Oak Island. Marty says he still shivers when he thinks about that event. John had been lowered down into a watery shaft and his equipment began to malfunction and he had to be pulled out. John just laughs it off and says it's part of the risk of his job. Marty tells him the other reason he wanted to speak to him and John explains the work he has been doing off the coast of Florida where he has been doing some dives and searching for the Florendina, which was part of a larger treasure fleet. He believes that he and his team can pull that together and it would be an important find for them. One month ago off the coast of Key Largo, Florida, John Chatterton and his team conducted a dive operation in search of a Spanish galleon that sank in 1733 called the Florendina. The ship was carrying a fortune in gold, silver, and jewelry. Each member of the team possesses a different skill set crucial to their mission. John Matera is the lead researcher and is a former security consultant. He first started hunting sunken galleons in his 40s. He grew up in Staten Island, two blocks away from the harbor, and he had a bunch of old shipwrecks on his doorstep growing up. That was when his love of them began, and as a child he promised himself he would one day be a researcher and adventurer who went out looking for shipwrecks. The third member of the team is Howard Ehrenberg, a scuba diver and a computer expert, which gives him a unique role on the team. He describes himself as a techno-geek, and he loves analyzing the data they gather and making everything come together. The wreckage of the Florendina is believed to be a mile off the Florida coast, and it is one of only two ships from the famously rich 1733 Spanish treasure fleet that has yet to be found. The final journey of the Florendina began on Friday the 13th of July, 1733. That morning, 21 Spanish ships that had come to the region in 1731 departed Havana, Cuba to travel home with a vast cargo of goods, silver, gold, and jewels that King Philip V needed to save his failing economy. Two years of treasure acquisition was spoiled because as they were sailing home, they traveled along the Straits of Florida and they would sail to the Azores and then to Spain. However, off the Florida Keys, they would increase in velocity and get caught up in a hurricane. The Spanish commander Rodrigo would try to turn the fleet back, but it was too late. By nightfall of the 15th, the ships would be crashing hard on the rocks or swamping in deeper water along the 80 miles of the Keys. Luckily, many of the sailors would find a way to swim to shore and survive the disaster, but most of the ships in the flotilla were lost. 300 years later, John Chatterton and his team are searching for the remains of that Spanish treasure flotilla that is believed to hold billions in gold. Off the coast of Key Largo, Florida, they begin the exhausting efforts to spot the Florendina. John Matera explains that contemporary salvers never found this shipwreck, and so it stands to reason that they could soon find and claim all of that treasure. Their first step is to survey the ocean floor nearest to where they believe the ship went down. 
they are using a piece of technology that is a tried and true part of their toolbox, a magnetometer. Howard says he believes it to be the most important tool to use when looking for historic shipwrecks because the magnetometer can sense the Earth's magnetic field. The narrator gives some important context about the magnetometer, explaining that every piece of ferrous metal or iron creates a magnetic field that will displace the Earth's magnetic field. This means that if the sensors on the magnetometer detect a stronger signal, it may indicate that there is a presence of an iron object such as cannons or anchors from a sunken ship. Howard says that with the equipment, they can sense the different variations and calculate the mass of the object even if it was buried underground. Howard says that most of the shipwrecks they find are completely buried and the magnetometer can see through the sand and detect large pieces of iron. As the team surveys the ocean, Howard describes it as being similar to mowing the lawn. They lay out the survey pattern, which is basically straight lines back and forth across the ocean. After they scour the waters, they take back their magnetometer if it has not located anything. Howard says that they have a ton of data from the magnetometer that they have to process. But first he notes that they are very close to the Infante and they decide they should dive it. The Infante is the wreck that was last to see the Florendina. They believe that it is the wreck that was closest to the Florendina and it is their current reference point. The history of the Infante is that it was another Spanish galleon that sank in the waters very close to the Florendina that day in 1733. Although the Infante was previously found by salvage divers, if John Chatterton and his team can locate it, they may find important clues to the Florendina and its treasure. John Matteris explains that the Infante saw the lights of the Florendina right before they wrecked, and then after they wrecked, the lights disappeared, taking the Florendina from sight forever. For nearly half an hour, they are in search of the Infante, and they have no sign or hint of where it could be. They are meant to be right on top of the wreckage, showing the incredible difficulty of locating even a known shipwreck in the unpredictable depths of the ocean. Suddenly they find something and they realize that they have been on the wreck all along. There are layers of wood on top of it and John Matteris tells them that the galleon had been replanked because the Torito worms right before it returned to Spain. The Infante was a massive ship and the Florendina was a considerably smaller vessel. Since the Florendina is about half the size and tonnage, it will likely take them a lot of work and luck to spot her in the ocean's floor. As the men examine the Infante, they realize that the reef has grown totally over the cannon, and according to John C., they had more visibility than he thought they would have, and that gave them a visual advantage and allowed them to do some documentation on the site that they may have otherwise missed out on. They note that the wreck is mostly running north-south, they spend more than an hour documenting and confirming the wreck. When air supply runs low, they are forced to resurface. They are very surprised at the excellent condition of the wreck, and they believe it lends credibility to their own search for the Florendina. The preservation and spread out nature of the ship make them wonder what else is scattered on the ocean floor. For the team, they are a step closer to discovering the wreck. John Chatterton tells the Oak Island guys that he is headed to the Dominican Republic because any finds there are bound to be important. But he has one ship he has eyes on, an important ship from an important time, he says, building the tension in the room. He says that he is quite serious about finding the San Miguel, which was a Spanish ship that sank in 1551 on its way back to Spain. So it must have Aztec artifacts, coinage, might even have precious stones. John Chatterton announces that this may be the oldest known shipwreck in the Americas and they are pretty sure they know where it is. John is sure he knows where the San Miguel is and his suspicion is that they will find a great deal of the hull buried there and if that is the case then that means they are going to find a lot of things that went down with the ship. The San Miguel was tightly connected to Cortez and the Spanish coming into Mesoamerica where they spent a lot of time killing and stealing from this foreign land. They spent half a century exploring the Americas from the Caribbean to modern-day Mexico where they would force their own culture and religion on the indigenous Incan and Aztec empires. They also spent this time enslaving them while stealing untold billions in gold, silver, and artifacts. Paul Goldstein, an archaeologist, says that the historian John Hemming described the conquest and the conquistadors as a time when there was the spirit of a gold rush but the conviction of a crusade.
The Spanish melted the religious objects they considered idolatrous into bullion and coinage, and then loaded massive amounts of treasure into ships destined for Spain. In 1551, the San Miguel, which was owned by Chacon Medina, the second in command to Hernan Cortes, set sail from Mexico as part of a nine-ship flotilla. After reaching as far as the northern coast of the Dominican Republic, the skies turned dark and the fleet sailed directly into a massive hurricane. Heavy with gold and treasure, the San Miguel was battered by massive waves when the ship attempted to reach shore. The galleon was destroyed by the storm and sank to the ocean floor along with its millions in treasure. Marty asks John to explain why he believes he has found the ship. John says they did a survey that left them with a target. They are sure they have stumbled upon something quite old, and unfortunately, the season there was running out, and they stayed on site for three weeks. The problem was the ferocious surge that was moving divers back and forth 25 feet or more, so the conditions were just impossible to work in, so they were forced to leave. Matty asks for the status of this mission and their work in the Dominican Republic. Chatterton says that they need permission from the government and they want to work with them on contract as partners, and he hopes they can make it happen. Marty is curious about the finances surrounding this trip, and he asks how much money he would expect to see given any ship of that kind of caliber. And John says he is sure that everything in the ship would be valuable. Marty is sure it must be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Rick says that what truly moves him and his imaginations is just the names involved in such an expedition, Inca, Aztec, Conquistador. He is enthralled with the history and story and the days that have come and gone in a flash. Marty tacks on that it's just the tip of the iceberg as the whole world is spilling out with ancient societies like the Romans and Egyptians and Portuguese. Marty thinks the oceans are littered with fascinating pieces of world history. Matty claims he hears the estimated amount of shipwrecks was around 3 million and only 1% of them were ever found. Matty says that he was curious just to get a number, so he tried to research how much the value would be if someone took those 3 million wrecks and started finding all of them. And the number he came to was 60 billion. Marty thinks that number is too low, as any galleon found would be worth a billion dollars in today's currency. Marty and Matty agree that there is no shortage of treasure in the world. Gary comes in, and he pulls something out of his top pocket, a coin fresh from Lot 25 on Oak Island. Matty passes it off to Rick and tells him to take a look at the image on the coin. Matty asks how Gary's treasure hunting, which is metal detecting, compares to John Chatterton's treasure hunting on the ocean floor. Gary says that it is quite similar. He says that their jobs are all about sand movement. He can watch on the beach and if he can see less sand in one area that makes him closer to the treasure. Gary claims that there is much treasure on the land as there is in the ocean. He says that people don't realize that those shipwrecks would wreck like 50 to 70 yards offshore, which is extremely close to the shore. Gary then shows them his greatest find, a 22.5 carat Inca gold with nine flawless emeralds worth three quarters of a million dollars that he found on the beach. Gary remembers the day like it was yesterday. He first found a silver coin on the beach, and then, when he got to the end of a shell pile, he dug and pulled out the ring, which at first he had mistaken for a champagne bottle top. When he saw the Inca gold and the emeralds, he felt weak. Matty asks what Incan treasure was doing on the coast of Florida, and Gary tells him hurricanes. Hundreds of ships attempted to navigate along the coast of Florida, and they carried a ton of treasure off the books. The Crown did not tax jewelry in the same way they taxed bullion gold, so they would try to make jewelry in any fashion they could to escape those taxes. This is the reason many are depicted today wearing pounds of gold on their persons. It was not a love of ostentatious jewelry, but tax cheats. Each spring, a fleet of Spanish treasure ships embarked on the journey back to Spain, and while the ships were heavily fortified against pirates, there was little they could do against nature, and the storms took their toll. After the 1700s, only one treasure fleet, the 1705 fleet, laden with treasure, got back to Spain. In 1715, King Philip of Spain found himself in a personal problem that motivated him to fund a new fleet of ships to bring him gold, silver, and jewels back from the New World. The king made his wishes known, and so people scrambled to gather up this treasure. The reason he needed all this treasure was because he was married to a woman named Isabel, who refused to consummate their marriage unless she got her dowry of jewels. 
1715 fleet consisted of 11 ships, six of them filled with treasures, and the rest were heavily armed in order to protect their cargo. Unfortunately for the king, the fleet of 1715 only made it to the Florida Straits, where they were hit by a terrible hurricane on July the 31st of 1715. Millions washed away into the sea along with Queen Isabel's jewels. 300 years later, the coastline near Vero Beach is known as the Treasure Coast due to the vast riches that still wash ashore to this day. Gary knew what he had found when he came across that emerald ring that day. He knew it was a ring destined for Queen Isabel if it had ever made it to Spain. Gary jokes that instead it went to his queen, his wife. Rick turns to Maddie and asks if he has a favorite underwater treasure. He responds that his favorite actually has less to do with the ocean and those shipwrecks and more to do with freshwater secrets. He trained to dive in freshwater and has always been partial to stories of people who would hide or dump things in ponds and lakes because they were running from some pursuer. Lake Toplitz is what he is most interested in. Rick immediately knows what he is talking about. Lake Toplitz is where the Germans supposedly hid their loot. Matty is animated as he describes witnesses seeing Nazis dump treasure into that lake. Rick asks if there is an ongoing search for those treasures and Matty says there is. But he does not want to let the moment pass before explaining the darker side of this, besides the obviously dark Nazi connection. The story he is getting ready to tell even ties into Oak Island a bit as well. People have been trying to find this Nazi treasure for years and people have done dives in the lake, and people have died doing this. Gary chimes in that there may be a curse on that lake if that is the case, and Maddie agrees it may be a curse indeed. Lake Toplitz is in the Austrian Alps, an idyllic-looking lake surrounded by gorgeous forests, but with a disturbing history. During the end of the Second World War, German officers reportedly dumped a collection of valuable treasure, including a legendary cache of gold, that was seized from victims throughout Europe to keep it from the hands of the Allies. Scott Andrew Selby says that locals claim to have seen things, people affiliated with the former Nazi regime also claim to have seen such activities, and people keep searching the lake for these items. To this day, no one knows the full extent of what was hidden and thrown into Lake Toplitz. But in May of 1945, a woman who lived along the shores of the lake was awakened by several visitors that forced her to help them. She recounted her experience of being forced to gather her horses and her cart together to help these Nazis move around 60 to 70 crates and then deposit them along the shoreline of Toplitz. She watched on as the carts were emptied and placed on barges and taken into the lake and sunk. She did not know what was inside but knew their general location. After the war, Allied troops organized a search of the lake, but the conditions of the lake made diving especially dangerous. Lake Toplitz is one of the most dangerous lakes in the world, according to historian Andrew Selby. The danger is in the rapid disappearance of oxygen in the lake. Only the upper 65 feet of the 300-foot lake is fresh water, and below that, it is extremely salty water that contains no oxygen. Of course, anything at the bottom of the lake will not rot or decompose. Andrew Selby says that they know for certain that at least five treasure hunters have died when trying to dive into the lake and search for this treasure. According to treasure hunter Jerry Lee, the divers were primarily skin divers that got tangled up in the branches and trees at the bottom of the lake and had to be pulled out later. It was not until the late 1950s that a dive was funded by the German magazine Stern to solve the mystery of the lake. Divers recovered 350 million pounds worth of English counterfeit currency. The bills were perfectly preserved thanks to the lake's unique waters. They were a part of a secret operation called Operation Bernhard in a plot to destroy the British economy. The Nazis wanted to hide this scheme, so they took the equipment and the bills and sunk them. In 2005, treasure hunters Norman Scott and Jerry Lee launched a high-tech exploration of the lake to find out. They were guided by a hand-drawn treasure map they acquired when researching the site that seemed to indicate the presence of an underwater cache of gold. It was written in German, so they had it translated, and it specifically says, treasure, with an arrow pointing at a spot in the lake. They detected a rectangular opening at the side of the lake, and it is their belief that a large amount of gold was deposited there. They believe the gold came from a chief lieutenant of Adolf Hitler, who was responsible for bringing Nazi gold into Lake Toplitz and depositing it into the cavern. The movements there seemed to indicate that they meant to hide all these things.
not dispose of them. Unfortunately, the team was stopped from making the dive, so no one has been down there in 70 years. Andrew Selby says that as the years go by, the deeper the treasure will sink into the silt and dirt. He believes that someone needs to retrieve the treasure instead of letting it rot in a cave. Marty says that it would trouble him to be looking for anything related to the Nazis, but Rick thinks that bringing it back and giving it to the world to where that treasure once belonged would be a valuable thing to do. Matty says that treasure hunters are always thought of as greedy of searching for treasure and keeping it for themselves, but he thinks that it doesn't have to be that way and that treasure hunters can also be interested in giving back things that were taken from a culture to reclaim it. This thought is very satisfying to him because he knows that one thing that bonds them is the love of history, and in his view that is something that motivates a lot of treasure hunters. To find that Nazi treasure and to be able to return something incredible like artwork or something would be incredible. Rick says that he remembers asking his father what they should do if they actually find the treasure of Oak Island, and his father saying that they should do good with it without any hesitation. Rick says it isn't just about a monetary donation, but to keep the stories and histories alive for future generations. Gary believes it is brought to life when they pull an artifact out of the ground and they can feel the weight of history upon them when that happens. Giving back through their treasure hunting and inspiring people to follow their dreams is the most rewarding experience for the Oak Island team. The treasure they found was friendship. What are your thoughts about this? What will the Legina crew end up doing next? Will they end up with the mega find or all their resources are just going to waste? Subscribe to the channel if you are enjoying the content so far.